Good afternoon and happy Saturday. My name is Takiwa Smith. I'm founder and executive director of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics Link Incorporated, also known as SCM Link. And I want to welcome you to our very first Step in the City workshop of our 2021-22 program year. The STEM in the City workshop is a program of our Math and Science Career Academy, and the goal of this workshop is to introduce you to Earth and environmental sciences. STEM is all around us, and Earth and environmental sciences focus on the STEM of our everyday lives, how we have access to clean water, the food we eat, the air we breathe, our soil that we playing at the beach, the ocean, and it can back the seafood, our food. And so the earth and environment is critical to our life. And so we need scientists to continue to study this. And so that's why we introduce to you to these fields. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Carlin Pounders, our program coordinator, who is going to introduce you to today's speaker. Thank you so much for that, Tequila. So today we are talking soil and plants, as was mentioned. Um, our featured speaker for today is Dr. Akinyala Abdullah, who is very passionate about helping students to prepare for STEM careers. She strives to increase diversity in STEM by participating in community outreach opportunities like this, and through her work as an associate professor of environmental science at Virginia Union University, also known as BUU in Richmond, Virginia. She has studied the toxic effects of metals in animal systems, and her current research interest focuses on the effects of air pollution, including metals in air, on urban garden grown food. Dr. Abdullah manages the Virginia Union University Greenhouse, where she has hosted community urban gardener partnerships and plant education workshops. So you know we're gonna be in for a really good workshop today. She also works with the VUU Green Team to bring programming such as Earth Day celebrations and hosting environmental film showings as part of the Richmond, Virginia Environmental Film Festival. So to, to VUU. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Abdullah. Good. I guess it's yes. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you very much for the wonderful and warm introduction. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Ms. Tokiwa Smith. I am super excited to share the good news about ecology and food cultivation in urban communities. Um, I am Akinyela Abdullah, as it has already been <laughs> explained. Okay, I don't know if um, Carlin uh, would, might, might not mind helping me with this, but um, this image right here is of a garden. And uh, I usually ask people who participate um, in these workshops to kind of help me describe or, or do sort of like a reflection, like what do you see and how, the, how do you feel about what you see? So Carlin, if you can jump in and, and let me know, you know, what do you see and what are your thoughts? Okay, sure. Um, so I see some beautiful rows of plants, but above them, there's some like scary looking uh, gray clouds. And also, now that I'm looking at the clouds, I see that they look like they're coming from some kind of plant. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an interesting combination to have this food right next to whatever's going on in the background. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, something else that I noticed um, is the uh, the power lines. Um, and I do see, you know, there's a person out there tending the garden. And so um, when we think of ecology, we think about how living, or first of all, we, we always identify the living aspects of a space or an environment. And then we also think about the non-living parts of that same space. And what ecologists usually do is they're looking at the interactions between the living and the living and also the living and the non-living uh, in a particular area. And so I am an environmental scientist. We take it a little bit further and we look at, you know, reflecting on this, this image here, 
there are some human activities happening and the humans are living, of course. And then we see other living components like the plants and the trees. And even we see the soil and we know that soil has living constituents and also non-living parts. But we see that the human activity centered around generating energy for human, for human uses um, we see the power lines. We know they carry electric current, which we use to power all of our devices and, um, you know, uh, provide electricity for our homes and businesses and things like that. But in addition to that, we also see a power plant in the background. And we see that, you know, some of the uh, waste generated by that power plant are those clouds or that smoke that Carlin identified. And so as an, as an environmental scientist and even an ecologist, we might ask the question, how are these human activities impacting the environment? And for the purposes of the discussion today, we're concerned about those gases that are generated from those power plants. And then there are other sources of pollutants that are not um, pictured here. Um, but all of these man-made activities generate waste, which um, can, you know, can be pollutants, and those pollutants can impact for the purposes of our discussion, food production. A lot of times you don't usually see power plants situated in areas where there are large agricultural um, plots of land or large plots of land used to produce food. But in this case, you do see um, someone planted a garden in an area close to a power plant. Sometimes power plants are in urban areas. So this image right here says a lot it says a lot about the impact of humans on their, on the environment. It says a lot about people, um, the influence of human activities and waste generated by human activities on food production. And then we can ask the question also from this image, why is this person producing food? Um, maybe they're doing it because they enjoy cultivating food. Maybe they're doing it because they live in an area uh, that could be classified as a food desert, which means they don't live, um, they, there's not a grocery store or somewhere where they can buy fresh produce within a mile from their home or a distance that they can walk. So as an environmental scientist and an ecologist, these are some of the things that will concern us. And for people who, are, um, who live in low income, areas or, you know, they may not have access to, to resources, to an abundance of resources. This could be, um, this is an issue of great concern. So I just want to share a little video that gives a little bit more of a description of, about what ecology is. So just one second, please. Okay. How many different, How many different types, types of types organisms, of organisms do, you do you see in this, see this picture? picture? Or how, How many, many different, different living and non-living items, items do you see in this picture? As you study these pictures, you begin to get a clue about what ecology is all about. Welcome to Moomoo Math and Science and What is Ecology? Ecology is the study of how organisms interact with one another and with their physical environment. Ecology isn't just about rainforests or other types of forests. Have you seen mold grow on bread? Or mushrooms grow on rotting logs? Or watch ants search for food? If so, you have seen examples of ecology in action. One goal of ecology is to understand the distribution and variety of living things in their physical environment. For instance, you will find different living and non-living objects in the desert, compared to a coral reef, compared to your backyard. These differences in nature are driven by interactions among living organisms as well as between organisms and their physical environment. As an example, let's go back to the mold growing on bread. Mold is more likely to appear on bread than, say, a rock. Why might this be the case? Well, maybe the mold needs certain nutrients to grow, and these nutrients are found on the bread and not on a rock. You can classify these interactions as either biotic, which means living organisms, and abiotic, which are non-living objects. Ants, dogs, 
fish, mushrooms, plants, and this praying mass are examples of biotic factors. Clouds, sunshine, water, and diamonds would be examples of abiotic factors. Let's apply the idea of biotic and abiotic factors to another organism, one that a field ecologist might be likely to study. For years, the population of honeybees has been declining in North America. Bees are very important to their environment because they help pollinate plants. Understanding the main factors responsible for this decline in bees help ecologists form plans to protect the species. Ecologists may ask the question like this, why is the bee population declining? Ecologists would then draw on many areas, including biology, genetics, earth science, chemistry, and physics, to name just a few to help solve this question. Ecology can be studied at five broad levels, the organism, population, community, ecosystem, and biosphere. Let's take a look at each level. Organism. An organism can range from a single protist to a large animal like an elephant. Population is a group of organisms of the same species that live in the same area at the same time. A community, a biological community consists of all the populations of different species that live in a given area. An ecosystem consists of all the organisms in an area, the community and the abiotic factors that influence the community and biosphere. This is planet Earth, viewed as an ecological system. So in summary, ecology is the study of how organisms interact with one another and their physical environment. And remember, kindness always multiplies kindness. Thanks for watching, and Moo Map uploads a new map and science video every day. Please subscribe. Okay, so we are um, a little bit more familiar about what ecology is. And I, I just want to make sure everyone is clear about the idea that there are living and non-living aspects to a space or an environment, and that there are the interactions that occur in those environments are what we are concerned about. Um, the impact of a living organism on the other living organisms and also the impact of the living organisms on the non-living part of the space and vice versa. So the uh, issue of concern for this topic today is that there are sources of air pollution in urban spaces that can impact urban grown food. And so we already looked at the top picture where we see the power plants and the waste generated by power plants, that gas gets into the atmosphere and it can settle on the food crops just by uh, disturbances or by wind. It can also be washed out of the atmosphere when it rains or if there's any some other type of precipitation and those gases can uh, end up in the soil and then be taken up by plants. Some other sources of urban air pollution are transportation. As a matter of fact, transportation is the number one source of urban air pollution. Um, so you see the car tailpipe with the exhaust gases coming uh, from the car. Um, there are there is a landfill picture down at the bottom of the screen. That is the locate the place where we take where our trash is sent, um, and there are gases. Uh, the gas methane is released from the um, landfills. Um, and so that is that pipe that you see with the, a little red coloring on it. There's a gas being released from there. Um, and it may be even a flare um, because excess gases are burned off when they're produced at um, landfills. And then there is an oil field in the picture at the top right. And that is also, uh, those also flares that are burning uh, gas. And you can see black smoke is produced. And so um, I, I included this one because when I visited LA, I was very surprised to see a lot of oil rigs just uh, along the, um, the, the highways uh, in the city, just busy streets in the city too. There was an oil rig over there. I was like, oh, that's fascinating. I had never seen that um, so close to uh, places where people live. Um, now I'll even speak to that. A lot of times these polluting, producing um, 
man-made structures or entities are usually located in areas uh, where people with low income um, live. And that is an environmental justice issue. Um, and a lot of times people in those communities have to choose between possibly having an employer come to their location because they need jobs and at the same time um, dealing with the issue of the waste that's generated by the, um, by the industry. Um, so that's a tough choice to make. Okay, so in urban areas, if a person lives in a food desert, they may choose, one reason they may choose to urban garden is so that they will have access to fresh produce. Um, there are uh, several other reasons why urban gardening is, is a great practice um, you can have fresh food that you know what types of chemicals or pest, uh, um, um, what I want to say, fertilizers or whatever nutrients you use on your food, you will know what it is as opposed to having food produced somewhere else and not really knowing what it has been exposed to. Um, it's a great way to bring youth and elders together in the community um, to, to you know, engage around something productive. Um, so those are several reasons why people um, engage in urban gardening. So I'm thinking as an urban gardener, I'm doing a great thing. I'm taking um, the issue or matters into my own hands. I'm, I'm producing food. I, I want to be able to go out and clip off a tomato because I want to make some tomato sauce or have a salad or something like that. Or I'm growing um, lettuce, um, iceberg or romaine, and I'm gonna, I want to go out and grab some greens so I can mix up a salad. Or I'm growing collard greens, which is what I'm growing. And um, I, I, want, I want collard greens this evening so I can go out and clip them. Or maybe I'm growing herbs that like uh, I really love basil. So I, I can go out and clip off a, a few um, leaves of basil to make a nice fresh pesto. Well, I think I'm doing a great job of growing my own food because it'll not only am I um, increasing my consumption of vegetables, but I'm also eating food that doesn't have a lot of chemicals on it, um, like pesticides or insecticides or something like that. But I didn't think about the fact that I live in the city and I'm growing my food and the air around my food may be adding pollutants to my soil and then those pollutants may be being taken up into the plant. So I didn't think about I might be eating contaminated uh, food. It's just a thought. And so that is what I'm interested in, um, actually uh, looking at the quality of food that's produced in urban gardens. And I am by no means discouraging anyone from urban gardening. As a matter of fact, I am encouraging people to get out um, and do more urban gardening. Uh, an additional uh, benefit from urban gardening is it gets you moving around so you get some exercise and you get vitamin D because you're out in the sun. So those are all great reasons to urban garden. Um, and I will make uh, provide some recommendations as to how you can avoid um, your plants taking up um, pollutants from the soil. So I wanna explain how plants actually get their nutrients and also um, what nutrients are essential for optimal plant growth. And the reason we eat plants is so that we can get these nutrients out because humans need nutrients too. As a matter of fact, we need some of the same nutrients we find in, in our produce. So if you look at the picture on the left, this is a plant and it shows the aerial part of the plant or the plant above ground. And then it shows the subterranean portion of the plant. Plants have three major organs. They have leaves and stems, and then they have roots. Um, and I'll describe what is happening with the roots. They actually don't do their job alone. They may have bacteria that assist them with gathering nutrients, and they may also have fungus that works with the roots at the root level to help with absorbing water and also access, accessing certain nutrients that the plant cannot access on its own. So you have ecology happening in the soil. And of course, we know that there are other subterranean organisms like worms that burrow into the soil and create so, uh, pore spaces. We don't want our plants growing in compact soil because then the roots are not able to extend out searching for nutrients and uh, the roots will not the pore spaces also allow for water to percolate into the soil, which um, allows the, the 
plants' roots to have access to water. Um, a lot of chemistry happens in the soil. Water is very necessary. It has to be able to dissolve these nutrients in the soil because the plants actually absorb the um, nutrients once they are become what we call bioavailable, which means they're dissolved in water. Um, the pH of the soil is also important. Some of these nutrients have charges on them. Some of the bacteria in the soil has charges on them. So having an optimal pH, I believe between 5.5 and 8 for most uh, agricultural plants, most food crops, um, it's, pr it's pretty good. So testing your soil pH is really important if you're going to do some urban gardening. Um, so if we take a look at the nutrients that are listed here, these are going to be what we call your micronutrients. Um, I don't know if people can identify them. This is where you have to remember what you learned in chemistry, those elements from the periodic table. So we have copper, Cu, chlorine, Cl, let's see, nickel, uh, manganese, zinc, sodium, molybdenum, iron, cobalt, I believe, and boron. All of these are, are what we call micronutrients because the plants use those in small quantities. And then we have some examples of what we call macronutrients. Um, and it's not that they're applied above ground. It's just that they're just up here. So the, the plant needs these two. And these nutrients will also um, be taken up from the plant through the roots from the soil. But just to make it easier to see, um, they were just spread out in, in the image. So we have silicone, sulfur, calcium, nitrogen, phosphorus potassium and ma ma um, magnesium. And those are what we call macronutrients because they are required in larger quantities. As a matter of fact, when we are growing our plants, we will apply some extra nutrients. Um, we can assess our soil to see what the nutrient content is. And if we find that all of these macro and micronutrient concentrations are low, then we can apply a fertilizer to our soil and get it conditioned before we even start our plants. But occasionally you wanna go in and fertilize your plant anyway, because the plant can take up these nutrients. And so instead of the nutrients being in the soil, the nutrients will be stored and used in the plant aerial organs and some in the subterranean organ as well. You may have noticed there's oxygen here and there's carbon dioxide and notice the arrows in the direction that they are pointing. So plants, produce oxygen through a process known as photosynthesis. And in order for them to do that, the plant has to take up carbon dioxide and it also has to take have, have water. See, water is listed here, H2O. And we also need sunlight. Sunlight provides energy for the photosynthetic reaction. And as a matter of fact, it is the sunlight that splits this water molecule. And that's where we get our oxygen from two water molecules will be split, two oxygens will be released from those two water molecules, bind together and form oxygen. And then that oxygen will be released from the plant's leaves and into the atmosphere. And for all of us aerobic organisms, we love that. We are super excited and appreciate the plants for, for making oxygen for us because we need it to breathe and we need it for our metabolism and a whole host of other biochemical processes. So we really love plants because they give us oxygen. And all of the carbon dioxide that is naturally produced by plants and humans and other organisms, that carbon dioxide is taken up by the plants and that is going to be transformed into sugar. And um, usually if you see that photosynthetic um, equation, it usually has um, glucose. Uh, as the sugar that's produced. But this is the way that sugar is produced, uh, period, by the transformation of atmospheric carbon dioxide by plants into sugar. So this is what is happening with the plant. This is why plants need nutrients. This is These are the locations where photosynthesis is occurring. I talked about organisms that are involved in helping plants to gather nutrients from soil. Talked about why nutrients are very important uh, for the plant. Um, I'll just give you an example. Um, chlorophyll, at the center of the chlorophyll uh, chemical that plants use, which makes the plants green, is magnesium. 
So a lot of times, if you notice that your plants um, chlorophyll levels are decreased by you see the yellowing of the leaves, um, that's an indication that the plant may need to be uh, fertilized because it's missing at least magnesium. But nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are also essential macronutrients, and they usually come in fertilizers. And you can see on the package the ratio of the nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, but there, you may also notice on the package the concentrations of calcium, sulfur, and all of these other nutrients as well. If your plant starts to wilt or the color starts to change, all of those are indicators that the plant needs fertilizer. Okay, so I mentioned that plants need all of these fantastic macro and micronutrients. And um, this is, I'm going to talk about how a pollutant is a chemical and a pollutant, a chemical can mimic the essential macro and micronutrients. And so the plant is designed to take up the nutrients. But if there is a reduction or if there's a deficiency, if the plant is not getting enough nutrients, sometimes if a pollutant is available and it's chemically similar to the macro and micronutrient, the plant kind of will take up the pollutant uh, instead of the um, nutrient because the nutrient is not there. The plant just needs the nutrient. So if, it, if there's a pollutant that's chemically similar, then it will take up that nutrient. And so how, that can happen. Um, the new, I mentioned earlier the gases from, from burning fossil fuels, uh, coal, oil, or um, what did I say? Coal, oil, or... Oh my goodness, I'm having a, a brain fart. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, the, all of the fossil fuels that can be used, um, including the methane gas, uh, those all can be absorbed from the soil. Usually those uh, pollutants will be washed out or they will land on the soil dry from air disturbances. And they once they get into the soil and if they're dissolved and the gases become dissolved in the water, the plant can take them up in their roots. And then they can store those pollutants in the leaves and sometimes even in the stem. And that's why these arrows are showing you the direction that those nutrients would um, be transported into the plant. Now, some of the nutrients are metals. Um, and I know I'm referring to the pollutants as nutrients because the plant doesn't look at it as a pollutant. It looks at it as a nutrient. So um, it experiences it as a nutrient. Um, and metals are part of it. I focused in my research on metal accumulation because there are some metals, some of the macronutrients are metals, some of the micronutrients are metals. So there are some metals that are essential, which are the macro and micronutrients, uh, metals. And then there are some metals that are non-essential, like cadmium. I have worked with cadmium for quite some time now. Cadmium is a toxic metal. It has no significant biological function, uh, except I think there's one type of bacterium or fungus that can use it, but all other organisms cannot use it. As, and as a matter of fact, if it accumulates in the body of an organism, it can cause cancer. So we don't want to be eating any uh, food that has a high concentration of metals that can lead to cancer. Okay. So I talked about several reasons why um, someone would engage in urban gardening. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how you're addressing, if you engage in urban gardening, you may be addressing what we call food insecurity. This is a condition um, assessed in the food security survey, uh, which is launched by the USDA. And it is defined uh, by whether or not a household uh, the, the level of income in a household and the social conditions of that home um, are limited or there's an uncertainty associated with the amount of food that they have available to them. So that is how you define food insecurity. There's an inadequate amount of food available to uh, within a home. And then a person experiences hunger, which is a physiological condition that results from not having access to the proper amount of food. Um, there are several organizations that work towards helping to provide food for people who don't have access to the appropriate amount of food. 
One of the organizations is called Feeding America. And um, I have listed their website here if you wanted to go and take a look at it. Um, in 2020, one in five Black individuals experienced food insecurity. And during the pandemic, 21.6% of the Black community may have experienced food insecurity. And that um, also includes one in four Black children. So this is definitely an issue. Um, and uh, people in communities have decided, you know, I think instead of waiting on some big grocery chain to come to my area, what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and start a garden myself. And I think that's fantastic. We just want to be safe when we're doing our urban gardening. Okay, so I've listed here. I normally, when I'm doing this workshop and there's more interaction, I'm able to ask people to, to list several benefits and several disadvantages to uh, urban gardening. Um, but I just went ahead and put the chart here. These are just some of the um, benefits and some of the disadvantages. So um, there's an aesthetics, especially if you keep your garden tidy, um, your garden can actually beautify an area. Um, a lot of times people will take old lots, vacant lots, and they will establish a garden. Um, sometimes they call that guerrilla gardening because people will establish a garden in a location that they don't own. And I do recommend that you ask first. Um, however, there are lots of people who have just taken over a plot of land uh, that seem to be um, left uh, unattended and they will establish um, uh, urban gardens in those areas. Uh, let's talk about a disadvantage. Um, you need to be careful when you do select a lot, especially if you don't know the history of it, because that area may not be suitable for growing food. And so some of the things that you can do when you establish your urban garden in places where you are not sure about the history of the plot of land is you want to actually erect what we call raised bed gardens. You do not want to plant any seeds for food cultivation in soil that you do not know the history of. Um, because that soil could be contaminated already and you don't want to eat um, any contaminated food. So you would do a raised bed um, garden. It could be a pot garden um, if you don't want to purchase the wood and the liners and things like that that are suitable for raised bed gardens. You can actually just use containers um, and you would have to buy soil um, or if you wanted to get soil from a company or even from a surround a area that you know the history of the soil, I would still recommend getting a soil test to find out what um, the soil contains. Uh, another benefit of um, urban gardening is it may lead to an entrepreneurship um, uh, event. So some gardeners do grow enough food and they participate in uh, farmers markets. Um, if you one seed or a couple of seeds can grow a lot of food it, and it may if you don't have a large family you may find yourself having an excess of produce and you might find that you will share with your neighbor. Maybe your neighbor can grow tomatoes and you grow lettuce or basil and someone else grows onions and then you can exchange. Um, but some people will take that excess produce and participate in farmer's markets, and that could be another way to make some extra income. Um, one of the disadvantages uh, I mentioned earlier, if, if you do not plan your urban garden properly, then you may be generating more waste and releasing that waste into the environment, and that could be bad, but you may also be um, establishing a garden poorly in all of your efforts um, you're going to be spending too much energy and maybe too much money um, because you did not plan properly. And you may not get a great yield. So it's very important to plan uh, when you are establishing um, an urban garden. Um, one other disadvantage I wanted to mention um, is finding when you find a location, take into consideration the fact that you're growing food. There are lots of living organisms that like food. So you may find yourself competing with other organisms. And in the case of you growing food for yourself, any other unwanted competition is referred to as a pest. So you may uh, attract deer depending on where you live. Um, believe me, there are some areas that are um, uh, very near, some urban areas that have forested areas where um, wild animals may live. 
Um, you may also attract field rats or rabbits. Um, so, um, or even a large uh, populations of unwanted insects. So you have to figure out how will you address those, you know, what strategies will you use to reduce competition with other organisms for your produce? So I didn't mention all of the benefits and disadvantages, just a few, but I hope that you had a chance to look through the, um, through the chart for um, at each, each one of these. Okay, so what do you need to start an urban garden? Number one, you will need seeds. So you can purchase seeds from, I've seen seeds uh, at the dollar store, um, Lowe's, Home Depot, you could go to a nursery. And my favorite thing to do is to actually save seeds. So I actually have about six pepper plants that I um, established from seeds from a bag of peppers that I purchased from a grocery store. And I've harvested so many peppers from those plants and I've given away so many peppers. So you can save your seeds from um, some of the foods that you purchase from the grocery store and you'll have, you know, dry them, lay them out so that they can, you know, rinse them off, lay them out so that they could dry on a paper towel or a paper bag. And uh, once they're dry, you can store them in um, a paper bag or a plastic Ziploc, write the date on them um, and, uh, and, and keep them until you're ready to use them. Don't keep them for too long because the seeds viability is really important. Um, I think seeds may have a shelf life unless you I know that there are there's a large seed bank <laughs> located in a very cold place. I can't tell you the name of it right now, but it's it's like a fail safe area for us to store seeds just in case some natural disaster happens and um, the government uh, and the world uh, needs to have access to seeds. So you could probably store some of your seeds in the refrigerator to, to um, increase their um, shelf life. Um, but seed viability is really important. Um, you're definitely going to need water. So that goes with into planning. You want to make sure you um, figure out what your source of uh, watering your plants is going to be before you pick your location or while you're, you're deciding where you want to uh, create your uh, urban garden. Some people purchase large containers or rain barrels and they put those on their property um, on the plate uh, at the location where they're establishing the urban garden and then they just water from, um, they create an irrigation system like that, but you have to have water. So remember that when you are de deciding the location where you want your urban garden to be. Unique um, containers, or you can do the raised bed garden, or you can have a soil assessment if you want to sow your seeds directly into the ground. And then of course, you're going to need some additional nutrients and fertilizer because uh, remember the plants are going to be taking the nutrients out of the soil. Um, and so you want to be prepared to replenish the soil so that your plants will have an adequate amount of nutrients. Okay, I wanted to go over what a seed actually is because I find that fascinating. I, I did not, you know, I didn't know this until I learned it in my biology classes, but seeds are pretty much the baby plant with their food in a little container. And so when we eat seeds, so, you know, think of legumes, beans, um, and then we have a, a, an example of a popcorn seed here. These are examples of seeds. And inside of the, the seed is the baby plant uh, and all of its food. So here I'm going to identify or show you the structures that are classified or that make up the baby plant. So here we have two leaves. These are actually the first leaves. When you germinate a, uh, a seed, these are the leaves that are going to come out first. And then beneath them will be the hypocotyl, which is the precursor to the stem. And then at the very tip of that is the, um, oh, you all can't see that, so I have to use the name. Uh, the epicotyl are the first leaves. The hypocotyl is the uh, structure beneath the first leaves. Oh, you can't see it. Okay, I'm sorry. And then at the tip of the hypocotyl is the radical. That's what it's called. It's not labeled here, but that is the precursor to our root system. And then everything else around the baby plant is the plant's food, the seeds, the baby plant's food. And so when you're germinating a plant, uh, a baby plant, it is going to initially need water 
to start its metabolism. And once it gets water, then it will start to consume these portions that are called cotyledons or their food until um, once, once the cotyledons are all used up, that is when the plant definitely needs to be planted uh, in another medium. It could be soil. It could, if you wanted to plant them in soil, it could be water. If you wanted to do hydroponics growth, or it could be clay beads. If you, that that's also used for hydroponics, um, you can use um, coconut husk. That's another medium that you can grow. You can use rocks, um, but you have to make sure that your medium can uh, be a, a location where nutrients can be uh, housed, so that the plant will have access to nutrients. Um, there are two classes of seeds that are produced by seed producing plants, and so one of them. Uh, are the dicots or dicotyledons. These seeds have two pieces uh, or two cotyledons. And then you have your monocotyledons. These are seeds with only one piece. So your popcorn, um, I think bananas, those are all, those are examples of monocot seeds. So here the baby plant and the corn seed is here. And these are the, um, the radical which is where the um, roots will come from, and then the epicotyl, the first leaves, and then in here will be where the um, stem develops from, and that's the hypocotyl. So when we're eating beans and when we're eating popcorn, we're eating the baby plant and its food. Thank you, baby plants, for growing up into adult plants and making more fruit and seeds for us to consume. All right, I'll never pass up a chance to talk about one of our great elders and ancestors, uh, Baba George Washington Carver. He uh, worked at the Tuskegee University, my alma mater in Tuskegee, Alabama. And he, um, he worked almost kind of like as an extension agent. That is a person who goes out into the community of farmers and um, teaches workshops on how to improve the, the best management practices for agriculture. So one of the things that he did is he um, went to farmers and um, explained to them how they needed to replenish their soil and um, some of the nutrients that needed to be in the soil, which I mentioned earlier, it are nitrogen, is nitrogen. So one of the great sources of nitrogen are legumes and peanuts happen to be a part of the legume family. He would tell them that they needed between growing their different crops, they would need to harvest their crop and then they would need to plant what he called cover crop. And peanuts could be a cover crop. And another cover crop you may be familiar with is clover. So they would grow that in between the different um, crops that they grew. Um, and then they would chop those peanuts up or the clover and leave it on the field. And that would replenish the soil's nitrogen concentration. So we thank him because of course, everybody knows that he made a multitude of products from soybean, um, not soybeans, from peanuts and from sweet potatoes. Um, and he was just an all around awesome agriculturalist. Um, and uh, so I put the bag of fertilizer here just because, you know, we talked about how you need nutrients. And so he contributed to um, disseminating the, that type of information to farmers so that they can have productive farms. And this applies to urban gardening, too. So if you want to see how it would work to plant some cover crop in your uh, raised beds in between different planting seasons, um, try that out. See if it works for you. All right. So I mentioned earlier that. Plants make oxygen and they make sugar through a chemical, biochemical process known as photosynthesis. And so I just wanted to show you that you already know this, but it's really good to kind of put it all together. So of course, we know our plants are going to need water. Water actually gets things going. You know, the release or the addition of uh, the formation or the disruption of water molecules releases energy, and that energy is essential for biochemical processes. So we talked about how water is essential for uh, dissolving nutrients to make them bioavailable to the plant. The plants can't take up the nutrients if they haven't been dissolved in water. So, you know, I just mentioned two reasons why water is very important. So we need water, and then we also need carbon dioxide. Now, 
You may be familiar with one of our um, major environmental issues is climate change. And you may also be familiar with um, the fact that scientists are saying that the amount of carbon dioxide that human activities are um, uh, releasing into the atmosphere um, is, is said to be responsible for the increase in atmospheric temperature, which leads to global warming, which leads to climate change. Um, so that's planting more plants can help with the reduction of atmospheric CO2. But, you know, there there is a natural amount of CO2 or carbon dioxide that's going to be released because it is a byproduct of metabolism from living organisms. Every time we exhale, we release carbon dioxide. Every time a plant goes through its metabolic processes, it releases carbon dioxide. Every time all other organisms go through their metabolism or respiration, they release carbon dioxide. Those are natural sources. When scientists talk about carbon dioxide levels and their association with climate change and global warming, they're talking about the additional amount of carbon dioxide that is being produced from human activities and how we need to um, live a more green life and reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. So we need water, we need carbon dioxide. The sun helps to get the, um, provide energy to get this process Moving along, remember I said the energy from the sun is what splits the water molecules. You get split two water molecules, you get two oxygen, elemental oxygens. They bind together and form um, oxygen O2, which is what we all breathe. So we're making oxygen. And then that carbon dioxide is going to be transformed into sugar. And that is what we are eating the food from for also. We get the sugar out of our vegetables. I know some people are like, sugar and vegetables? Yes, there is sugar and vegetables. Um, we get the sugar. And as a matter of fact, the sugar that we eat is made from sugar cane, which is a plant, or beets, which, is, which are also plants. Um, but in addition to that, there are other um, vegetables that also produce sugars or carb carbohydrates. That's what, that's what I should say, carbohydrates. So this is photosynthesis, and these are all of the elements that are required, and this is a very important um, biochemical process that happens on the planet. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the research that I'm currently engaged in. Um, and I have some undergraduate students that are working with me. I am a professor um, at Virginia Union University. I know you see some other stuff in the background and that's fine. Um, but this is a picture of our greenhouse in full bloom. We oftentimes um, provide the space for community partners to come in and grow um, their seedlings. And then they take these out in the community and plant them in their raised bed gardens and they grow a lot of produce. So now uh, you may notice also there are some pots here. I think this is basil. We were growing basil, a lot of basil because we really like basil. So let's continue on our little tour. All right, so this is in the greenhouse currently. And the project that I'm working on, we are growing collard greens. Uh, we're growing them out of season. So I do want to preface with, uh, what you'll see. So it, the temperatures are pretty hot um, in Richmond, uh, Virginia, which is where our campus is located. Um, collard greens are normally a winter plant or fall and winter plant. So they usually grow during the um, November to March or November to maybe February. Um, but we're growing ours out of season. And we're growing them in pots on our campus. Our campus is an urban campus. So we're located right next to uh, Interstate 64 which is our source of air pollutants. Remember earlier I mentioned that tra transportation is the number one source of air pollutants um, in urban areas. So, so you're going to see our pots. We have four groups. We have four study sites. Our control plants are grown in the Virginia Union greenhouse. And then I'll show you the, the experimental pots on the different locations at different distances away from I-64. So... Here we go. We're in the greenhouse. And these are our pots of our control plants. So they're in the greenhouse in a controlled environment, not exposed to the atmospheric gases. 
Um, and yeah, our students are taking care of them and when they, they have to remember to water them. So they, these look a little like they need a little water and that's fine. We do, we do um, give them water often. Okay, so this is the study site number one. And uh, if you notice here, this is Interstate 64 and this is our campus, Virginia Union University. And on this perimeter of our campus, it's right next to the highway. It's only separated by a fence. And you will see that the fence does have some plants growing on it, but it's open air here. And the plants are located in this area, which is 24.11 meters away from the highway. So very, very close. Um, and these plants are exposed to the exhaust from the highway. So. This is the site near the highway. Okay. And these are we have three lots out here. And if we did a physical assessment of the plant, it's taken into consideration that it is high and that we need to make sure we water the plant so that they don't dry out. Um, we're not for certain yet if being exposed to the exhaust may have made our you know, contributed to our plants looking a little dry um, and the leaves being a little damaged. We did also notice that there were some insects, but so that's ecology. There are some insects that were eating our leaves, but you can get a sense of how close our pots are to the highway uh, from this video. Great source of Pollution. Okay, so our study site two, and this is <laughs> STEM in the city. Uh, our study site two, um, our pots are located on our campus near our science building, uh, Ellison Hall, and they are 500 feet away from I 64 or 260.28 meters. So we use the metric system in science. So that's why I'm reporting the distance in meters. So it's 260.28 meters. So, and here, it, here are the three pots. So let's take a look. So we're walking up to our three pots. Um, and please notice in the background, there will be, a, this is a high traffic street. Um, outside of our uh, campus, um, you'll see uh, our three pots, you'll see some discoloration on the leaves. There were also some insects eating the leaves. So there you have some ecology and notice all of the cars driving by. And I'm gonna zoom in in a minute so you can see the highway from this distance. So notice the cars on the highway between the trees. and more traffic, more traffic, more exhaust. So our plants are being exposed to the exhaust from the cars. Okay. So our study site three is um, located a little further away um, near our band building, our arts building, um, still on that same side street and the distance is 422.26 meters. So just a little bit over half the uh, previous distance. Okay. So also notice this is our campus, Virginia Union. I just want to show you all some of our campus swag. And that is our. Um, that was our basketball arena. And notice the cars driving by and the plants, our three pots for this site are located near the fence. And uh, these pots also were affected. Look, ecology, there were some um, insects, some red insects um, that were attacking the first, this first pot here. But there's a little discoloration on the leaves 
Not sure if it is because the plants need to be fertilized, which we plan to do next week, or if maybe some of the air pollution may be uh, impacted the uh, health of the leaves. So what we plan to do is we are going to um, we are going to actually take samples of the leaves. We are going to dry them, and then we are going to use a method called inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, which will allow us to measure the amount of arsenic, lead, and uh, cadmium in the leaves. We're concerned about the quality of the leaves, and so that is what we're interested in. And so that is what I wanted to share with you all today. So I thank you for your time. And if there are any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm sure Carlin will, um, will uh, read your question and we'll get you the answer to the best of our ability. Thank you, Carlin. Yes, I love the tour. Since we are all about oh, yeah. exposure, I think seeing the campus, like if some youth yeah. could just get a glimpse and, you know, put in their mind like, oh, I think I want to go there someday or, right. you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. thought that was so great. So we did have a question um, and let's see, someone asked, I'm pulling it up. Okay. Uh, what strategies can we implement to reduce pest competition? Okay. Okay, so there is um, there is this thing called companion planting. So I, I am aware that, um, well, I'll tell you about chemical, taking up chemicals, but there are some plants that do, some organisms, insects that do not like the smell of citrusy plants like citronella. So if you were going to plant, um, say tomatoes or something like that, maybe you could plant some other plant that is a detractor or something that pests do not like, like centronella. You could plant that somewhere nearby. Or you can plant some food plants that um, attract one pest that is a predator of another kind of pest. I have actually purchased, and I didn't know you could do this until I started to investigate it, um, ladybugs. I have actually put ladybugs, uh, released ladybugs around my plants. I, I did that more in the greenhouse because of course, if you release them out into the in, into your garden plot outside, they may just all fly away. <laughs> so, uh, especially when the food is gone. But if you, if you introduce them to your plants that may have a pest on it, like white flies or something like that, then the um, ladybugs will eat it. So you have to figure out what uh, what is a predator of a pest that you're having an experience with. And then also, are there any plants that you can purchase that would uh, discourage certain pests from coming to your garden plot? So I hope that answers the question. Yes, I think that was a really good answer. Um, they said they're really fascinated with the research. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think from uh, the whole presentation. Mm -hmm. And another question, how has electric cars impacted um, levels of air pollution? So I am I am an electric car owner and mm -hmm. um, electric cars do not generate directly carbon dioxide or any pollutants. However, electric cars do use charging stations and those charging stations do use fossil fuels. They do use coal, you know, whatever the power plant um, is using as their source of energy, the charging station is plugged into that power plant. So while we're reducing carbon dioxide from individual vehicles, we are still um, contributing because of the charging station. So I still think it's a great idea if it's in your price point, right? If you can afford to buy an electric car and there are ranges of them now and prices um, also consider there's, there are ranges of distances that they can go to. So be, be sure to do your research uh, when you are considering buying an um, electric vehicle. But I do think it is a worthwhile investment. And as the networks increase in terms of charging stations, I think we're going to start to see more people purchasing electric cars. And when that happens, the price of electric cars, I'm sure, will probably become more um, approachable or something that more people can invest in. 
So you mentioned that you study call that that, that um, the research is on collard greens. Um, mm -hmm. Why did you choose collard greens? Is there a specific reason behind that? Well, honestly, I love collard greens. I try to grow things that I like. <laughs> so initially, I grew basil. Um, but collard greens are a staple among most people of color. So that is honestly why I chose collard greens. And I, I know I said that I'm growing them out of season, but I know that there are urban gardeners who are growing collard greens in the summer, just like I am. And so mm -hmm. that's why we chose those. Also, the metals are usually, the leafy green plants, they usually are culprits for, for taking up a lot of metals, heavy metals. And so um, I could have grown lettuce or spinach or something like that. But um, I chose collard greens because they're pretty hearty. And I know that a lot of people of color, a lot of African-Americans eat collard greens. So. That's true. Um, so during the presentation, I noticed that you also mentioned um, plant pr or seed producing plants. And I was wondering if, um, you know, you were making a specific distinct distinction because, you know, if, are there plants that don't produce seeds? Like I was thinking maybe like bamboo or weeds. Yes, there are plants that um, <laughs> there's a, a, a very nice system of classification for living organisms, period, because there's such biodiversity. And in order for biologists to be able to study all of these things, um, and, and be able to see what's, you know, what organisms have in common and what, what are the distinctions and what are their ancestors and what, you know, all of these, we have a system of, of classification of taxonomy and uh, cladistics and phylogeny. All of those systems work together to be able to distinguish between different species of organisms. So there are some plants that do not produce seeds. They use spores. Um, and then there are some plants that produce seeds. So a lot of the food plants that we consume are in a class called angiosperms. Um, I don't know if that's a class. Yeah. And the angiosperms are the seed producing plants um, and they produce seeds in a covering. So the fruit, they produce fruit, fruiting plants with seeds inside of a covering. And then you have some plants that are called gymnosperms and they produce seeds, but their seeds are not inside of a fruit covering. They may have like a seed cold or something like that. So for example, um, like a, a maple tree, you have seen those seeds and they have little fans on them. Uh, they, that's the seed that would be a gymnosperm and a peach or orange or an apple or banana, those would be a, a angiosperm plants, the seed producing plants with the protective covering over. And by the way, we were the, the portion of the plant that produced that the protective covering uh, in the angiosperms, it's, it's called the ovary. It's actually the female structure of a flowering plant that uh, develops kind of like a pregnant woman with seeds on the inside. And I thought that was fascinating too when I when I first learned that. So, yeah. So we eat we eat ripe ovaries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We eat baby plants and ripe ovaries. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I love it. Um, that's a, that's a perfect segue into, uh, you know, another question I had as far as, um, when you were talking about, uh, in your bio, the, the out, the community outreach that you do, um, like what is the response that you usually see from you when, do, do they get to go to the greenhouse? Um, you know, and, uh, well, that's kind of a sub question as far as do they get the opportunity to go to the greenhouse. But I was also thinking as far as with the work that you do, I imagine that it's a lot of touching and feeling of the plants and getting up close. Mm -hmm. So my question is what is the general response do you see from you when they're exposed to ecology like this? The children are, they love it. They love it. The, the only thing is, is I wish that, so I've worked with the summer programs. Um, I, I've worked with a friend of mine um, here in my town of Petersburg, where I live. We work with the Girl Scouts and we were able to get out and actually plant seedlings uh, into some raised 
raised bed gardens and those children really loved it. I loved it. I loved being on the ground and getting in the soil and everything. We put the liners down and everything. Those children loved it. I didn't get to work with them again, so I'm not sure. I'm, I'm thinking that the Girl Scout troop probably did get a chance to take those young ladies back over to uh, to that plot, but um, also work with a, a, a math and science center that we are affiliated with. They bring the students up to the greenhouse and I've had, I've done a workshop with them to uh, plant the seeds. And I think they were in-house, so they got to come back up and water the plants and stuff like that. They really enjoy it. And they really, they enjoy learning about the different types of um, uh, plants and, you know, seeds and things like that. And learning that they're eating baby plants and everything that you, that tickled you, they enjoy that too. Um, so I would love to get out more and do more of that. Um, and we want to partner with our Richmond Public Schools. A lot of schools have gardens um, that they establish, um, but with COVID now, it's kind of difficult to, to get out. But as soon as we get back to whatever our new normal is going to be, I'm planning to be out in the community and doing more. I, I do workshops for um, garden clubs. Um, I've, I've done this presentation with garden clubs. I've done this um, discussion of the research with the um, NPR. Uh, they have a pub science program. And people, I learn a lot too, because of course, a lot of times, especially for the adults, I'm speaking to people who are engaged in gardening of some sort. So they tell me things I didn't know, you know, about places where you can go and have your soil analyzed and, you know, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, I love it. The children love it. The adults love it. Everybody is super fascinated by uh, growing food, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure we all learned so much from this presentation. Okay. Last question. What <laughs> advice would you have, would you give for future ecologists um, and environmental scientists? Okay. So, <laughs> In the video that I provided, I know the definition was centered around uh, ecology. However, I think he gave more of an environmental science definition than anything because environmental science is interdisciplinary. And so um, I know he mentioned that we depend to answer questions. We depend on chemistry and biology. We even depend on sociology and education and all of because environmental issues are everybody's problem and everybody can contribute to the solution. So I think that I would recommend that people sit and think about what are they concerned about as it relates to their environment. Um, and, and it may not seem, appear to be something that is an environmental issue. It could definitely be just anything, but what is the environmental angle or I guess going back to that original definition of ecology, it's all about interactions between living organisms. So even with the pandemic right now, this is an e ecological issue because we know that one human can pass COVID to another human. And the scientists who are working on trying to come up with um, strategies to help us reduce um, the transmission of COVID, are, you know, the, the mask and the social distancing and all that, those are actually ecological uh, recommendations and suggestions that are helping us to deal with the fact that we have to interact with one another. We just need to figure out how to do it in a safe way. So think about what you're concerned about and think about how the interactions between the living organisms impact each other and your issue. Think about how the living organisms impact their, the non-living uh, things related to the issue. And if you are interested in ecology, just I would read up more about it see how you can apply some of the principles that ecologists use to your to your um to help resolve your issue or whatever it is you want to study and just go for it surround yourself with people who are engaged in the subject area and mm -hmm. um yeah just don't give up just keep going just keep going just be relentless about trying to solve your ecological concerns i did want to take this moment to offer some suggestions about how people can reduce the exposure to atmospheric pollutants to their plants, because I didn't say that. But mulch is one way. You can actually apply mulch to the surface of your plants. Not only will it help your plants to retain moisture, but it also will keep those pollutants from landing on the soil. Because once it gets on the soil, if the soil is disturbed, that's actually where the plants are going to take the nutrients from. So that's one method. Or I mentioned coconut husk. That was another method. 
any way of creating a barrier between the atmosphere and the surface of the soil is a good way to kind of reduce uh, atmospheric exposure of pollutants to your plants. So that's great stuff. I'm taking notes. I will <laughs> be watching this again uh, because you know definitely trying to get my urban garden uh, yeah, set up. Yeah. So. We definitely appreciate you, Dr. Abdullah, for um, doing our first STEM in the City of our 2020-2021 program year. And um, I know that, uh, well, before I hand it over to Takiwa, I will also like to say thank you for watching and tuning in live, for oh, asking yeah. your questions. Mm -hmm. um, for it, There is a survey link that was put in the chat and we ask that you do that short survey so that we can continue to bring you the programs like this um, that interest you and you'll be able to take away things that you can implement like Dr. Abdullah provided with us today. So, Tequila, I know um, <laughs> I probably said some things that you were gonna say, but. <laughs> Thank you so much again, Dr. Abdullah. And we forgot to mention that Dr. Abdullah is actually on NCM Link's advisory board. So oh. <laughs> in addition to her teaching kids about gardens, she actually sits on a few different boards and committees mm -hmm. um, that impacts STEM education. So thank mm -hmm. you so much. Um, I think Carly did say everything. I am always amazed by your work, even though I do not like biology, but I care about <laughs> food. And I do get my food from the urban gardens. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the work that um, you do and plant scientists do to make sure that we are fed. Um, I do have one question. Um, this is random because I always think about this with um, food deserts, right? So they're always associated with like low income mm -hmm. neighborhoods. But I have a uncle who until two no, they still don't have a grocery store within a mile. Mm. But this is like a higher social, like middle class neighborhood and they don't have a grocery store near them either. So why are those type of neighborhoods where they have the resources to get in a car but they still don't have a grocery store near them? Are they included in the food? Why are, are they included in the food desert category? And if so, why not? Yeah, I, I think that they are considered in food food desert areas. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why those they those areas are not able to attract um, a grocery store chain. I'm not sure about that, but I do think that they are considered a part of the food desert. So rural areas are also places where you see a lot of um, food deserts. So, I mean, I don't, it could be a high end area but the issue, the people who speak the loudest usually about this issue are, are more than likely people from low income environments. But yes, I do think any place, there's that general defini definition of a food desert being a place where people cannot, uh, where the grocery store is further than a mile away from your home or a distance that you can't walk. You know, so yeah, they were. I guess they don't think about it because they can get in their cars, but it's mm -hmm. like, right. they still didn't have to drive now it's five minutes, but before it was like 10 to 15 minutes to a grocery store. You yeah. just didn't have to drive that far. Right. Um, so great. thank you so much. And I hope everyone enjoyed the cafe and look um, for the next. When is the next event, Carlin, that people can sign up for? It's in. Um, so we actually will be hosting our September Instagram takeover next Thursday. Um, and we will be having a forensic scientist uh, taking over our page and doing our Instagram live. So you can find us on Instagram at Simlink, but in two weeks, the week after that, we'll have our first Teen Science Cafe of um, September. Okay. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Abdullah, for giving us your time. Thank you. We're teaching us so much about ecology and urban gardens and everyone has, oh, whether you're live or catching us on our YouTube, please don't forget to take a few minutes to complete our survey. Thank you again, and we hope that you learned a lot from our STEM in the City workshop and that you pay, do enough to pay attention to your environment, especially think about where your food is grown 
and where you get your food from and how long you have to get in the car or walk to get it, right, Dr. Bula? Yes. <laughs> All right, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye. See you at the next event. Bye. <laughs> Bye.